Hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming to CP204, Transforming G Suite, and then a whole bunch of other sentences. Uh, we've already won one award for the longest title name at Next 2019, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, and remember, 20 minutes into the talk, you'll be able to start giving us feedback, so you can give us feedback in real time, depending on how we're doing. Um, my name's Luke. I'm a product manager on Google Doc Sheets and Slides, and I'm joined today by my colleague Scott, who's going to talk to you about video interoperability, and our friend Sam, who's going to tell you about their work at Atos. Uh, and I'll start us off by talking about some interesting interop features that we've launched this year for Google Doc Sheets and Slides. So we know that Microsoft Office isn't going away anytime soon. When you move to G Suite, You'll probably start out in a mixed environment. You'll have some people using Google Docs, and you'll still have some people working on Office. And then over time, you'll slowly migrate those people all over to Google Docs, but you'll still have external collaborators, partners, customers, contractors that still use Office. So you'll still have to have a way to work with Office content. And we know in the past this has been a big pain point for customers. Which is why this year we launched Office Editing Mode. With this new feature, you can now open and edit Office files using the Google Docs editors without changing the file format. No more worrisome conversions, no more finding the latest version. It's all seamless. So some of the interesting things about Office Editing Mode is that you can still work the way that you're used to in Google Docs. You can add comments just as you're used to doing. We're having a little delay here. Um, just as you're used to doing in Google Docs. So you don't have to change your workflow. You can also share using the power of Google Drive sharing so that you can collaborate with your internal colleagues that want to work on the Office file or your external colleagues all the way that you're used to doing without changing the format ever or having to go through any sort of worrisome conversion. You can even real-time collaborate, bringing the power of Google Docs collaboration to all of your content, no matter what file format it is. And on top of that, you can even use the Google Docs intelligence features, some of those magical experiences that make G Suite famous, now bringing those to any type of content, no matter who you're working with, no matter what file format you're using. So you can imagine this makes it really simple to continue to work all while keeping that same file, the same format. You can send it back to your colleague just as they sent it to you and just as they expect it using the Office format. But you get to keep working the way that you're used to because you're a Google Docs user and you want to be able to use all of our features. But you can imagine their experience as well. So they can find that file that they shared with you and just double click it and open it right back up in Office because the format hasn't changed. They'll see all the changes that were made by the Google Docs user. They can see any comments were added. They'll even see plus mentions, which you can use in Google Docs. We convert those as well to comments in Office that include their name and email address. And that way, they don't have to change the way that they work either. They can just go ahead and edit the document, reply to the comments, all using Microsoft Office, just like they're used to doing. And then once they save a new version and upload it to Drive or save it using Drive File Stream, you'll then see all those changes reflected in Google Docs. You get to keep working the way that you're used to, and they get to keep working the way that they're used to. And on top of that, we know a historic concern about using Office content with Google Docs is that you'll lose unsupported content. Well, that's why we've added original content preservation. Now, you can continue to collaborate with Office users, even if they're using features, for example, like you see here, Excel macros, which aren't supported in Sheets. You can continue to work with those collaborators and trust that we're going to save those macros totally untouched and return them to the Office file so that when that user opens the file again in Excel, they'll see those macros completely untouched. And if you're using some advanced Office features that are fully unsupported in the Google Docs editors, we've added transparency. 
So we now tell you exactly what you're going to lose, if you're going to lose anything in these rare cases. So that way you can make the decision before you even start to edit the file. And this way you know that when you're editing a file, and we haven't shown you any warnings, that the file is completely safe and will be fully intact when the Office user opens it up again. So these are just two ways that we're making it a lot clearer when you're collaborating with Office content. And on top of that, you'll be able to continue to use version history just like you're used to doing in Google Docs. You'll see both the granular edits made by any Google Docs user, just like you're used to, and you'll be able to see each version uploaded in full from the Office user. And it will be tagged as such. It will say this was imported from Excel, this was imported from Word. So that way it's very clear who's made what changes, even when you're collaborating across Office and Docs. So that was a lot uh, of talking about it, but we now like to actually show you it. So let's switch to the demo. So today we're going to take a look at Laura, our fictional character who works at Inc. 42. She's a G Suite user. She uses Google Docs Sheets and Slides. And she's collaborating with her internal colleague, Trevor, from the finance department, who still uses Microsoft Office. So we can see here Trevor has uploaded this Excel file. And it has a little action item for Laura to act on. So she can go ahead and open it up using Google Sheets, the same way she's used to opening a Google Sheets file. And she can find the comment from her colleague, Trevor. Notice that this is still very clearly an Excel file, but she has the Google Sheets user interface. She's still able to do everything she would expect in Google Sheets, including find this comment from her colleague, Trevor. So we'll go ahead and edit in what we think the projected growth rates are. And then we can even respond to Trevor and let him know that we finished this. Trevor will then get a notification email, and he can come in and edit the file using Google Sheets Office Editing Mode, or he'll see the new version reflected when he opens it in Excel. Laura also noticed that Trevor has forgot to update the internal project code name. So she's going to leave Trevor a comment to ask him to update it to the public name. Trevor will both similarly get a notification telling him about the comment, as well as see it when he opens the file back up again in Excel. You can see here now Trevor has actually decided to open it up using Office Editing Mode. So now Trevor and Laura can real-time collaborate on this Office document. You can see he's in here live making the changes while we're in the document as well. Now, Laura also noticed that Trevor has filled in three charts, but they're missing one insight. She hasn't done a lot of digging into the data, so she'd like to use some of the Sheets intelligence features to help jumpstart her analysis. So now we're going to use a feature called Explore. There's two ways you can use Explore, and this applies to both Office content and regular Google Sheets. You can ask it questions using natural language if you have something you already want to know about your data. But in this case, Laura hasn't even really thought about this. So she's going to scroll down here to Sheets Insights. These are interesting pieces of information that Sheets has figured out about her data and that Sheets are suggesting to her. So Sheets has found this really interesting relationship between the cost in Model A and the cost in Waymo. And she thinks this would be a good candidate for the graph section. So she can just drag this in here, lock it into place with the others. And she's now, oh, I think it needs to be centered a little bit more, perfect. So she's now added a whole new chart to this Excel file using Sheets Intelligence that'll then be reflected when Trevor goes ahead and opens it up in Microsoft Excel again. She can also use this interesting new Sheets feature on themes because she realizes that this red formatting isn't really consistent with the company branding, and she can change the entire format of the document with one click to a color palette that better suits their company's annual P&L statement. Um, 
And on top of that, like I was saying before, all these changes we've been making are in version history. So you can see Trevor creating the Office file, and then Laura and Trevor working together and creating all of their specific granular changes using Google Sheets. All of that synced back to an Excel file available to anyone who wants to edit this using Excel. So now let's go back to the slides. So just to recap what we saw there, opening and editing, in this case an Excel file, but it works for all different types of Microsoft Office formats, maintaining the file format while still allowing you to use some of the best features in Google Docs, adding comments, real-time collaborating, using our intelligence features, as we just saw there with the chart. And a couple of things we didn't see, you can also work offline on these Office files. And whenever you come back online, we'll sync the, whatever you did offline back to the Office version that you can then share with your Office collaborators. We also didn't see the original content preservation, but that Excel file may have had a macro attached to it. But all of that would be preserved, and when Trevor opens it again in Excel, that macro would still be there totally untouched. And like we did see, there's full version history on the file. So you can be really, really confident about who made what changes on the Office content, just like you're used to doing with Google Docs. So this is a totally generally available feature, and it's used by millions of people every day. So if you don't already use it, definitely give it a try. And now we want to talk about some new functionality that we're adding to Office editing mode, which will help you work on the go wherever you need to interact with Office files. So we're excited to announce that Office editing mode is coming to mobile, both for iOS and for Android. This means that now you can do everything we just showed you on desktop using your mobile devices. That includes real-time collaboration. You can collaborate across multiple mobile devices or between a mobile user and a desktop user. And that's just another way that we're helping you eliminate your need for Office licenses. Now I want to talk to you about how we're enabling you to work with collaborators who don't have any access to the Google ecosystem. So you can imagine here, Laura, that character we were talking about, wants to work with an external contractor at a company that still uses Office. They still use Outlook, and they still use the full Microsoft Office suite. So this person doesn't have a Google account at all, but they need to be able to get access to the doc sheets and slides that Laura works on so that they can collaborate together. And that's why we're announcing visitor sharing, which will make it easy for you to collaborate with users who don't have Google accounts at all. With visitor sharing, all you need to do is share files the way that you're used to with the confidence that non-Google users will be able to get access to these files. So you just put in the email address, which is how you're normally used to communicating with non-Google users. And that user will get a pin code to their email. So that way, you know that only that user can access the file that you've shared with them. In order to log into Google to get access to the file, they'll simply put in that pin code, and then they'll be able to join in and collaborate. And you'll see them show up just as you would any normal Google user, except they don't have a Google account at all. They're just a visitor. And so this makes it really seamless for you to collaborate across your organization, outside your organization, with users that haven't even been brought to G Suite at all yet. They don't have any sort of account. So we're excited to announce that this is in open beta. And if you're not already trying this out on your domain, we highly recommend you give it a try. So the last thing I want to touch on is how we've brought Google Docs Sheets and Slides to other content providers so that you can use our editors no matter where you create your content. So as of this year, you're now able to create Google Docs Sheets and Slides in other content providers that aren't Google Drive, like you see here in Box. And you can even use Office editing mode that we showed earlier to edit existing Office files on other content providers. And you can continue to use the third-party platform permissions of the other content providers while working with a doc sheet or a slide, as you see here with Dropbox, where the Dropbox sharing dialog is what's controlling access to this Google document. 
And most importantly for a lot of customers, you can continue to maintain the security and compliance features of these other content providers, because that's where the document is actually stored, while still getting to use the collaborative power of our docs editor suite. So this is a really exciting set of functionality we announced earlier this year and are now generally available that makes it easier even if you work with another company or if your company uses multiple content providers to be able to always access Google Docs no matter where you work. So now I want to hand it off to my colleague Scott to talk about video interoperability. Thanks, Luke. Oh. Thanks, Luke. As a G Suite user, I'm really excited by all the changes that you showed off. As Luke mentioned, my name is Scott Friedman, and I work on the Global Partner Ecosystems team in business development and partnerships with Unified Communications. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about interoperability for Hangouts Meet, Google's video platform. To illustrate, imagine if your phone could only call other phones of the same kind. That'd be crazy, but that's the way video conference works today. With interoperability, though, we allow for SIP and H323 standards-based video systems, like Cisco and Poly, to call into Hangouts Meet meetings. To continue with the phone analogy, interoperability allows for calls between all types of phones. During this session, I want to talk to you a little bit more about what interoperability is, how it's offered, and some different use cases and improvements we've made since the launch. Plus, we'll finish up with a special promotion. Oops. To offer interoperability, Google works with our technology partner, Pexip. We decided to work with Pexip because their culture reminded us a lot of our own. We both have a technology vision about the power of software and the benefits of scalable compute. Pexip has an engineering-driven culture, which prioritizes the user and product excellence. One of my favorite things about Pexip is when they first formed the company, one of their initial tasks was to build a massive video test rig. So every night, they're able to test all of their code on tens of thousands of meetings and check for bugs. In addition to similar cultures, another reason we chose Pexip was that they're one of the few companies that's able to offer a native view from the user's screen despite calling you to a different platform. This really mattered to us so that people who are calling from a Cisco system into a Hangouts call would still have their standard Cisco experience. For people in the Google ecosystem, interoperability is important because it allows for meeting solutions, our Hangouts Meet hardware and Jamboard, to work with their full functionality on Hangouts Meet calls with third-party devices. As much as we'd like for everyone to use Hangouts Meet in our hardware, we realize that isn't the case, and that people are using different video systems. One of the goals with interoperability was to remove the barriers for users to join Hangouts calls. We worked with Spotify early in our process of developing interoperability as an alpha user, and this quote is exactly what we were trying to accomplish. People are able to focus on having a productive meeting instead of making sure everyone can join the call. I also want to talk to you about another common use case for interoperability, which is mergers and acquisitions. Oops. Kayak is an independent subsidiary of Booking Holdings. Booking has acquired 15 companies that use a variety of different video platforms. Kayak uses Cisco for their video communications, while OpenTable uses Hangouts Meet hardware. Interop has enabled them to feel like one company rather than two separate companies by able to seamlessly join meetings together. Since the launch of interoperability last June, we have received a lot of feedback from our users and potential users and have been hard at work to incorporate it into the product. In the next several slides, I'll talk to you about some of the new features that developed. One of the improvements that I'm the most excited about and we're leading off with is dual stream support. This change allows for people to non, on non-hangout systems to present using their normal workflow and still have the video feed showing in the call. Well, this is standard for Hangouts Meet. It was not previously an interop when we rolled it out initially. This is a great improvement because it allows for both the speaker to have the presentation and be seen at the same time, which we found increases engagement. Oops. In 2018, Hangouts Meet added support for live streams, like company-wide all hands and other meetings, where the users needed to tune in but not necessarily participate. The enterprise SKU for Meet allows 100,000 users to join a meeting, and with the changes that were made to our interop protocols, non-Hangouts Meet users are now able to dial into those meetings which is incredibly exciting and will help to increase utilization and make it so all rooms can be used when you have those type of meetings. In the 12.30 session today, our group product manager, Samir, mentioned that we intend to enable public live streaming in the first half of 2020. When this is rolled out, it will work with interoperability enabled calls. We've already done the plumbing on the back end to make sure that works. 
Pexips also rolled out some new tools that allow for real-time call monitoring and troubleshooting of issues. When there are issues on a call, sysadmins can go in, diagnose, and fix them during the call via these tools instead of sending a following up the next day about what went wrong. This is incredibly powerful as it, help, as it helps to improve the user experience with problems being fixed on the fly. Another feature that we're really excited about is dynamic bursting. When interoperability first launched, admins had to go in and provision resources and say how many calls they expected and how many concurrent ports. However, when the nodes hit capacity, users weren't able to join calls. With dynamic bursting, users now have the ability to dynamically expand the conferencing capability and join calls whenever scheduled or unplanned usage requires it. The GCP instances for this are only started up when required and are automatically stopped again when capacity demand normalizes, ensuring that GCP costs are not wasted. Another thing about when the interoperability offering was launched, there were two ways you could deploy it, either on-premise or in the cloud. In a few months ago, Hexip announced a managed service offering running on GCP, which is incredibly exciting. This managed service allows users to enable interop and on a domain with a, in a few minutes and little to no technical implementation or hardware. Perfect. Running on the cloud as a service also simplifies management and the day-to-day -day administration of the system. All these features are running on the secure backbone that is global backbone and GCP. Oops. Another main area of feedback for our users has been around the discoverability of interop joining information in calendar invites. We've heard the feedback and are doing a lot of things to help solve this problem <coughs> by improving the visibility of joining instructions through a few different mechanisms. One thing we did is we reordered the things. You used to have the description of the meeting up top and then the joining instructions, but we found when there was a long description of the meeting, people often wouldn't get to see the joining instructions. So what we did is we pulled that to the top and moved the meeting descriptions to the bottom. Another one that we did is creating an icon for interop. If you look on the screen, you see more joining options highlighted. That's a new thing which, when people are hovering above it, makes it even easier to discover those. A final thing that we did was enable interop bridges as standard on all meeting room domains. Like if you have interop enabled, all meetings will go out with an interop bridge. We realize that there is still more work to be done, but we're really happy with the changes and what they've done to the user experience. One of the biggest pieces of feedback that we have received from our customers is frustration about entering the pin code to join meetings. It's not native to the functionality of a lot of their devices, and they're used to one button to push. As someone who has entered the wrong meeting code a few times due to fat fingers, I can definitely feel their pain. So I'm incredibly excited to announce that Pexip will be rolling out one button to push functionality for Cisco and Polycom endpoints in Q1. This native functionality will restore the experience closer to what they're used to when joining interop calls and removes the need for expensive or hacky solutions. So the final thing I'd like to talk to you about is the interoperability on-ramp program. At our user summit in Stockholm, Pexip rolled out this program, which effectively gives people who purchase a Jamboard or Hangouts Meet hardware the ability to try out Pexip's managed service with two concurrent calls for one year for free. For companies that are just getting into our hardware and starting to deploy it, this is a great opportunity for them to enable interop for, to allow rooms that they have which aren't necessarily on meet to join their calls and push Hangouts Meet hardware. Please visit booth F34 in the showcase to see a demo of interop in action or email google at pexip.com about this solution. I'd like to hand it over to Sam Franklin of Atos to talk about their implementation of G Suite. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Uh, and thank you very much, Google, for uh, inviting us to come and share this story with you. Uh, I'm Sam Franklin. I'm the head of Atos Consulting's G Suite offering, and I run our UK digital workplace practice. I'm delighted to be here to share a little with you about how Atos, who are Google's digital breakthrough partner of the year, are undergoing a move to G Suite for a section of our business. It's just a little bit about Atos. I'm going to keep walking because I'm behind on my step count for today. But we've got 110,000, oh, come on, I thought I'd get a laugh. Uh, we've got 110,000 people spread across 73 countries. Our UK HQ is in London, um, in Mid City Place, and we've got more than 20 offices across the UK. Since 2002, Atos have partnered with the Olympics uh, and the Paralympic Games uh, as the official IT partner. And in 2018, we had an 11 billion euro revenue, and that's growing yearly. 
Quite importantly for us, for the last three years, we've been recognized as a digital workplace leader in the EU and the last two years uh, in the US by the uh, analyst firm Gartner. And Atos is recognized in this space because we've got a major footprint in large global enterprises in almost every market sector. So why did Atos decide to go on the G Suite journey? Well, quite simply, to drink our own champagne. Our Google relationship formalized in H1 2018 as an enhanced alliance between Atos and Google. And as the cloud breakthrough partner of the year and a strategic partner between Atos and Google, we used to work in with Google Cloud and G Suite to enable our customers. And with a major footprint in workplace services growing with our G Suite customers, including existing customers that we've had uh, before the partnership and growing with customers since the partnership, Department of Health, Viola, PwC, FCA, uh, we decided to, to take a part of our business to G Suite. The decision forced Atos, who are a large systems integrator, to think about all of the challenges our customers face when going around this decision, and particularly the challenges around coexistence. Our main challenge, and the first challenge, wasn't technically technology related. It was about picking the right user groups. As a really large organization, we had to think about the right people to take on this journey. And we knew this couldn't be about individuals, it had to be about teams. So for us, we knew we couldn't take an exec without a PA and all that stuff, so we had to find teams that would really benefit from this. Two of the groups we picked, one was our business Unify. Unify um, was an acquisition, they're used to working outside of the Microsoft ecosystem, so they were an, a, a natural group as one of the candidates. And alongside them, our Help and Interaction Center, who support our customers on G Suite, so a natural fit. The scope of our rollout was to take our 20,000 users on a managed Windows 10 environment running Intune and Office 365 and all that old stuff and onto Chromebooks, Android and G Suite. Some of our central shared tools remain in place, like Circuit. Circuit's a unified product uh, that integrates with our PBX and now integrates into G Suite as well. That's used for, for some of our communication and calling. And in addition to that, our identity and Salesforce uh, environments. So all of this enabled uh, our, our staff to get started, but we wrapped it up with the same experience level focus that we do for our customers. And that set up those colleagues in scope for using G Suite to be able to communicate, collaborate, and coexist with their colleagues across Atos who hadn't yet moved. So we know that coexistence can work, but it does have some challenges. And the first we, we faced was the same as many organizations. The decision to enable 20,000 people uh, was a business decision. It was a business decision with sound business rationale and business benefits. But those implementing the change weren't from the business, they were from IT. And as we know, and I, you know, I see some knowing smiles in the audience, that can sometimes be a challenge. Our central IT function is steeped in years of Microsoft technology and behavior, so our change management program had to start there. Global IT developed their own center of excellence, and that gave them the capabilities but it meant that the repeatable patterns that Atos have used to enable coexistence for our customers, such as Pearson and the Department of Health, wasn't being leveraged and created some challenges. The first test users weren't able to forward emails or share documents externally, so the selling G Suite bit didn't go so well for the first couple of days. But that made the task of onboarding and enabling our, deep user, bit, our user base a bit more of a challenge for our change management team. I personally think they prefer the challenge, but nevertheless, it made it a bit more of a challenge for them. We also had an identity and license challenge with all of our Office 365 users needing a Google Cloud identity in order to be able to work seamlessly with their colleagues. So I mentioned the challenges for business change and adoption. We're lucky in many respects in this area as we've got folks who have been doing this, uh, doing, doing this business change and helping customers with their digital breakthrough for years. In fact, I see some of them that they've been doing it since before digital was really a thing. So they're really experienced in, in doing this with our customers. But in all seriousness, it was very refreshing for me and my colleagues, such as Richard Van Delft, who leads our G Suite uh, business globally, to see our business not just running this as an IT migration activity, but taking the opportunity to run business change activities that we would normally do for our customers with our own internal colleagues. We followed there or thereabouts Google's recommended change adoption approach led with our own, some of our own tools and techniques that we've developed over the years. We started, of course, with engaging all of our stakeholders, selling our digital workplace vision, and dealing with all the myths that existed. 
and we moved through the phases onboarding and enabling our teams before moving into a key part of our experience level focused approach, measuring the user satisfaction, continually looking for opportunities for improvement for service, and closing the education gap. And we did this in part with the Atos Workplace Assistant. This Chrome add-in allows us to push a set of mandatory learning links to all staff, followed by a tailored role-based set of information. So we can push sheets, hints, and tips to our analysts and guidance on running Linux on Chromebooks for our devs. We also use this tool to push tailored surveys for feedback and combine all the data together with usage data to improve the experience for all of our colleagues. So what's our way forward? Well, we're on course to complete the rollout, and we're focused on the route forward. The Chromebooks and G Suite bundle that we've deployed internally uh, complete with its experience level focus, we launched yesterday as a subscription service for our customers. And we're very excited. If people are interested, you can find that information on our website, atos.net forward slash workplace as a service. And as we continue to deploy additional functionality to our own staff, we'll keep looking to add that to the new Atos Workplace as a Service offering. I think today's announcements will genuinely help us. Sharing with non-Google users has been a real challenge for us, and I think the code sharing option that Luke presented will be a real step change. But I think along with the ease of collaborating, co-authoring, and communicating that both of the guys demonstrated will help us internally and with our customers to make the change even more of a success and to make it stick. Thank you. I'd like to invite Luke and Scott back on stage to join me, and we'll open up the floor for any questions. Nice work. Thanks. So any, any questions? from anyone in the audience. Thank you. Oh, there's a microphone coming your way. We've got one over here. Any others? OK. Two at the front. One in the front row, one in the second row. We'll take the front row first. Thank you. Hi. We've been using um, Google now for about a year and so. And obviously, what I find, what was missing from the presentation was um, shared drives. So obviously, shared drives are a new feature to Google G Suite. And we found it to be slightly um, boundary to us for when we're doing things to, to share uh, our files. And we've had the share permissions and the share facilities. One of the biggest problems we found with shared drive was basically sharing folders. Um, we've tried to make our environment uh, as much as possible what people are used to in the Windows environment. Um, what are the features of uh, shared drives in, in G Suite or what are the plans for it? I can do that. Oh, right, I don't. You have a mic <laughs> We're not passing mics around. It's on my head. Um, so yeah, the the subfolder sharing problem we know is something a lot of people have been requesting. So that that's an upcoming feature that'll let you set specific permission boundaries on folders within shared drives. Um, that's the main one I can think of there for the challenge. But there are there's going to be increasing uh, features to both to share drives and to my drive um, to reconcile the differences more between the two sharing models um, and add additional like subfolder sharing, additional customizability to share drives so that uh, you're not the only customer that felt kind of limited by the existing sharing functionality. So that's, that is one of the key things that Drive is working on over 2020 for sure with um, new customizability updates launching throughout the year. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's not meant to replicate pre-cloud sharing. And so kind of like what we were talking about here with the migration, we always encourage customers to rethink their sharing boundaries, make things more flexible. That's actually another um, series of updates coming over the next year. But basically changing how organizational units can have predefined sharing boundaries that uh, will let you keep things internal that are sensitive, but also open up potentially to external collaborators. You know, another piece of feedback we've got is that when you're outside the domain, you always get that warning, that very static warning, like, this person's outside your domain. Is this acceptable? We're going to give admins more customizability there so that you can say, OK, well, these external colleagues, this team works with all the time. They should basically be treated as uh, internal. Or you could even set up internal firewalls. 
Um, you know, financial institutions may have divisions that really shouldn't talk to each other legally. Uh, and you can set up those boundaries internally so that you can almost treat these as two different silos of users that should not communicate with each other. So that's, that's some of the functionality, that and others, we're going to add over the next year to uh, make it a little more customizable for you. As a gentleman in the second row. Office files working offline. How would you, well, how would, how do you um, reconcile differences? So conflicts in case the Microsofts of native people edit offline, upload back, and then you do the same from the sort of um, drive side of things. How do you reconcile that? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question actually that I, so I was saying, great question that I didn't touch on there in the presentation, but that's another example, kind of like version history and commenting, that we tried to make the experience as similar to what you're used to doing in Google Docs. So if you've ever taken a Google Doc offline, made changes that then had conflicts with changes someone else made, maybe offline, or they were online while you were offline, um, we send you through the same exact change reconciliation flow uh, where it gives you the diff and explains, um, you know, that you need to decide what to do with these changes that can't be merged against each other. But for changes that you've made offline on the Office file that are reconcilable with the changes that someone else has made offline on the Office file, we just automatically reconcile them for you. Um, and when you go into version history, you'll see both what that person did as well as yours, as if you made your changes on top of what they did, even though you didn't know about them. Um, so definitely give it a try. I'm sure there are some limitations to it. You can ask me about it the next, next. <laughs> uh, one from the gentleman at the back there. So what you just said probably answers it, but just so I understand, and sorry if I'm asking what you've already said. So Trevor opens a Google sheet, uh, I mean, goes into file stream and opens an Excel document and is working on it live. Laura opens the same document on the browser. Now Trevor makes a change and clicks save. Does that automatically come up on Laura's screen and doesn't save another copy? That's my first question. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good point. One, um, we never create another copy. That was a key piece of feedback pre-office editing that we heard loud and clear. This will always be one file. We're not gonna make copies of things. Um, and so that is, you actually did ask something new, because that, here I was talking about when you're offline, this is where you're both online, and one person is live editing in Office, and the other is live editing in Docs. So every time the Office user updates, you get in Docs a little notification that um, there, there is a new version, and then it's either in most cases where the changes are easily reconcilable, you can keep doing what you're doing, it's just, we update whatever changes were made in Office, and you get that notification so that you're not surprised. Um, if there are changes that you need to reconcile, then you get sent through that reconciliation flow. Okay, my second question is, so, and this is not a Google file stream session. Nonetheless, if both Laura and Trevor were working on Microsoft Excel, and Laura updates and saves, will Trevor's changes save another copy? So they, they won't save another copy. Um, it depends. The file stream will similarly always update that Office file. Um, and you can use this extension to add to the experience, which is uh, a file stream drive. It's called Drive Presence. It's an extension you can add to Desktop Office that will make this experience a little clearer when it happens. But it, it will be as if the... Uh, office file changed underneath you while you were editing. So once you have the extension installed, uh, it'll very clearly say there was a new version um, and either similarly just sort of transparently reload uh, the Office desktop editor that you're working in or um, it actually has its own reconciliation flow if there are irreconcilable changes that you need to make a decision on while you're editing. Um, but if you, even if you don't have that extension installed, it's not as pretty or full-featured of an experience for the Office user, but the file will update. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, there's another gentleman there. Thanks. Oh. Hi. Questions on video operability. Uh, PECSIP requires a different license? Yes. Yes. Second, it's a little bit hidden, the part of the Cisco and the Polycom data for the H323, how to dial in. Are you thinking of making it a little bit more visible because people usually get lost there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can elaborate on that. Yeah, we are thinking of making it more visible. We made a few changes to calendar already where we make more joining options visible up top. It's now a separate line item with an icon that you can click. And with the rollout of one button to push as part of the PECSIP service, that'll make it even easier where you don't need to find the joining instructions if you've already associated a room with the meeting. But we are doing more to kind of work on calendar discoverability. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm a Chromebook user. Um, I was wondering if the Office file editing was coming to the Files app in Chromebooks. Because the moment you have to go to the browser to open the file. So, so we haven't uh, announced anything about that yet, but I would say look out for it because it <laughs> would it would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it, if it came to that Files app? <laughs> right, the gentleman up the front here as well, and then. Uh, over there as well. Uh, last year it was talked about that uh, Google Meet will somehow connect to uh, Google Docs and that it would automatically take meeting notes. Uh, How is that project going along? I think I know about that project, um, but I have, I'm not sure about launch if, timelines at all. Yeah, it, We're happy to get your contact information and follow up on what we're doing on that. I don't know if your microphone was on there. Oh. Hello? Um, quick question. Um, do you allow the non-Google users to work offline? So when you, when you share with the pin code, when you do the changes and you're online, fantastic, saved. When they work offline, are those changes saved as well? Great question. Uh, the caveats there are that user will need the office editing offline extension to be installed. Um, like everyone, uh, it comes pre-bundled with Chrome. You just, the first time you use offline editing, it's, it's that acceptance dialog you have to make. Since this is effectively a new user account, they will have to accept that. Um, and uh, it's controlled by the settings of the domain that that file's in. So if, for say, that domain has turned off offline editing, it won't work, that user won't be able to do it, um, and it'll be a file by file basis for that user because they're a, a temporary sort of fictional account, but with those caveats, yes. <laughs>